Would the Clico policy holders and the shareholders ever get back their money? Thank you for joining us on this month's edition of Time to Face the Facts. I'm Jerry George, so happy to have you. Tonight we're going to look at something that represents a huge financial disaster, but we're also going to look at the human disaster that it has created, how catastrophic it is. The people who have worked, who worked hard, did all the right things tonight they're not sure of what their future might be. We'll be right back with you in just a moment. If you are serious about business, then log on and participate in Business Advantage. Every Monday, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m., log on to www.niceradio.info. Business Advantage inspires you to believe that the man who wins is the one who thinks he can. Business Advantage with host Jerry George, mentoring the next generation of Caribbean entrepreneurs. 8 to 10 p.m. Mondays on www.niceradio.info. For further information, email caribbeaninformationhub at gmail.com. Like the Business Advantage Facebook page or call 1-784-456-5967 to participate. To thrive in today's dynamic business environment, you need the right partner. Digicel Business is that partner offering you the flexibility you need to flourish. Our scalable solutions will increase your effectiveness and efficiency while enabling workforce mobility. Large or small, you can hide from potential threats to your business. With a partner protecting your interests, you can focus on productivity. It's amazing where the right partnership can develop and how far it can take you. Contact us today. Digicel Business, complete solutions for your needs. The Clico, the Clico debacle was called by the former governor of the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago a massive fraud on the public. In a letter to the Attorney General, the DPP of Trinidad and Tobago says it looks like larceny. Somebody has called it the perfect crime. And this evening, we're going to be looking at just what happened with what was the Caribbean's biggest corporation ever. And joining me is... Mr. Kerry Simmons, he is an opposition MP who shadows commerce. And a little bit later on in the program, we'll be joined by the Trinidad and Tobago CLECO policy holder, Mr. Peter Promel. Welcome once again to Time to Face the Facts. Kerry. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you very much for having always, me. Always very modest when, when I have you as to how to call <laughs> you, but that's okay. Now, I know Barbados has been really embroiled. Barbadian sh uh, shareholders and policyholders have really been embroiled in this whole matter. It has been the subject of discussion in Parliament last couple of weeks. That's right. But first, what, has you, what is your own candid view on this whole situation? That it is an understatement to call it a massive fraud. <clears throat> it, it, it really has been a governance and public administration nightmare and a disaster on in both Trinidad and Tobago and Barbados, and by extension, I fear the same portents for the Eastern Caribbean. Yeah, I don't think anybody has, has, <coughs> escaped, has escaped the, 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 the total disaster mm -hmm. that this has, has been. But how, how did this all begin? What is your understanding of the genesis of this? Well, a few things happened that should not have happened, and that is what lays the foundation for me to call it a... Uh, a, a public administration disaster because in a real sense government has a major role to play in this as well Absolutely. even though obviously Clico is a private company. In Trinidad and Tobago as in Barbados there is an office of supervisor of insurance and any entity which is licensed and allowed permitted to, to sell insurance should therefore be regulated properly by the office of the supervisor. Now, one of the key things that you have to do in Barbados, and by extension equally in Trinidad, is that you have to have a statutory reserve fund. And that statutory fund is, is so-called because it is created by statute under the Insurance Act 
chapter 310 of the laws of Barbados. And the fund requires that you have um, assets placed at the disposal of the Office of the Supervisor of Insurance, which would be equal to your liabilities. Um, now, what happened in Trinidad and Tobago, as I understand it, is that in 2007, which would be the year before the crisis broke, in December 2007, there is every reason to believe that the, the fund in Trinidad was deficient or in deficit by about 600 million Trinidad and Tobago dollars. The supervisor of insurance seemed to be reluctant or the office seemed to be reluctant in taking drastic steps at that stage. A year later, by the end of 2008, evidence now suggests that this fund would have been two and a half billion dollars in, in deficit. Um, so that the first issue that we have to deal with is the legal requirement, because it makes little sense now just quarreling over spilt milk. We have to look futuristically mm -hmm. at where we're going. And one of the things that we have to do is to make sure that the offices which are playing the, or performing the role of being regulatory bodies are sufficiently alert and strong um, as to be able to make sure that this kind of thing does not happen again. Above and beyond that, however, Clico was plagued by um, transactions which were very questionable. Some of them were... You call it plagued? Plagued. Plagued. <laughs> I thought that was the normal course of action. <laughs> but... Some of them were, were inter-party um, or in, inter, inter company, company. transactions. Um, and then there were others which were related parties. For example, loans to directors or to managerial people, lines of credit being extended, um, money moving from one company to another. And in fact, there's every reason to believe that money may actually even have moved from the the, the, the statutory fund and then be replaced at another time when once it is called upon, the company is called upon to demonstrate that the assets are in fact there. But, but that alone tells you where the government failed. Right. Because the company should not have had access to the statutory fund like that. Well, this is the, these are the issues. And equally, no, there are two things. Yeah. One is that nobody seemed to have paid attention to how they kept the statutory fund funded. Mm -hmm. That's the first part. The second bit is that, as you say, it's, they seem to have had access to this money somehow. And that is, that is the point. And in Barbados, because I can speak more specifically to Barbados, we had the unhappy situation where um, even as the situation reached crisis proportions in late December of 2008, going into 2009, an arrangement was being put in place uh, well, on the ground in Trinidad and Tobago, you would have had the government of the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago and the, 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 uh, and the, at the level of the governor of the Central Bank meeting with CLECO um, in order to discuss the enormity of the pending problem. And even as that was happening, you have in Barbados a situation where um, funds are being moved through the office of the, the, the law office or the former law office of the then former prime, uh, the then prime minister, $3.33 million to be precise. Um, and assurances being given a couple days later that Clico was well managed and prudently run and Clico Barbados was completely untouched and unscathed by what was happening in Trinidad. And we were told no. the same thing in St. Vincent and in the, well, in, in, there in you the go. OECS. Yeah. And one of the things that... that the accounts, accounts were different. Precisely. Now, one of the things that we're going to have to discuss, hopefully, during the course of this, 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 um, this, this program, is the fact that at the very get-go, undertakings were given by the Prime Minister of Barbados, um, as he then was, that the Eastern Caribbean would be looked after in any settlement of this matter. And that was then followed up by his successor in office, Mr. Frondo Stewart, and indeed by Mr. Stewart's Minister of Finance, Mr. Sinclair. So that in a real sense, what has happened is that commitments have been given to the Eastern Caribbean, which today remain unanswered. What is before the... Yeah, but who could have given those commitments? Let me just give you a sense of what we're talking about here. 
in the Eastern Caribbean, mm -hmm. okay, and I'm speaking here specifically of the, of the OECS, the ECCU, mm -hmm. okay, an amount of $1.05 billion is what we're talking about. Absolutely. For the seven OECS countries. Absolutely. What is interesting about that figure is that 82 million of that is in the form of annuities and investment contracts. Mm -hmm. We'll come back a little bit later to that. While that was happening, BICO's deficiency in the fund was $775 million. Mm -hmm. Okay? No. But the, uh, when they actually did it, the ECCU says that they believe that it was more like $945 million. The figure for the OECS countries, every single person in the OECS, man, woman, and child, right, would have, could have had $1,565 for the monies that were lost in this debacle. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is absolutely amazing that at that time, the money set aside was $30 million. You have over a billion dollars, and what was in the statutory fund was just $30 million. Right. And, and that is where... Incredible. That is where the complete breakdown in adequate supervision um, by the regulator takes place. And it is something that has to be... We have to make sure if anything comes out of this at all, Jerry, it has to be that this must never happen again. We have failed, in my view, even after this calamity, to take the necessary and urgent action in order to make sure that, that we put a stop to this kind of possibility. Now, the loophole is glaring. I mean, it is, there is no doubt that there should be a regional solution to this because it is a, a regional problem. One of the things that people have pointed to, and I think that the politicians have failed to deliver, is a financial services agreement which would seamlessly be enforced across this region so as to make sure that uh, companies offering financial services, for example insurance companies, are not able to do what you call regulatory arbitrage, which is simply to exploit the loopholes which exist in one territory so that they can buccaneer in, in, in another but territory. But it's almost blatant. Mm -hmm. You have, for, for you to be able to take deposits in the region as far as I know, you have to have a banking license. Yeah. These people were taking deposits like a bank. And you want to tell me that nobody in the regulatory um, apparatus? America has a thing which they call too big to fail. I think that what we stumbled across in the Caribbean was the reverse. It was too big to be controlled. <laughs> and, no, but you have to be frank. I like and, that. And, and in many ways, Clico found its tentacles deep into the governance system in Trinidad and Tobago. And when I say governance, I mean in the political party system. Clico found its tentacles deep into the political party system in Barbados. Clico found its tentacles deep into the political parties process, processes in the Eastern Caribbean. Completely. And, and, and this is true in almost every one of the islands. Um, so that as much except as it is... Except St. Lucia. St. Lucia except, was well, the only country that was smart enough not to get involved in this foolishness. And so we, we have a situation where, you know, the private entity became exceptionally close to the political entities. There's a, a lovely quotation which came from Mr. Leroy Paris when he talks about his relationship with Mr. David Thompson, um, uh, how they are not only friends but godfather to children and that kind, to each other's children and so on and so forth. And, and he's, one is a lawyer to the other and that kind of thing. And it just goes on and on. And then we had the, the unseemly disclosure coming out of the, the Deloitte and Touche uh, report, which was the judicial manager, judicial manager's report, and they indicate that much of the the, the bonuses and, and, and salary um, benefits that Mr. Paris would have gotten would have been passed through, for some strange reason, Mr. Thompson's law firm. So that, and that was even after Mr. Thompson had declared that he was no longer a, a, a relevantly interested party in his law firm because he'd become prime minister. But still funds were passing through that, that, that so entity. We're talking about incest here at all levels. Because at the end it's of the day, of you quite ri rightly said it. When you check back, Mr. Dupre had access to every, just about every prime minister. That's true. And, and, and in the Eastern Caribbean, so did Mr. Paris. 
-hmm. But let me say there's another aspect of this about which we have remained silent as a region and about, and about which we must speak, even though it is a, a difficult thing to speak about it. And that is the issue of accountability and the tracing of funds. Because it let, is let's, clear that let's first take a break, yeah. uh, because you're going to make a very important point, I believe, at this point. This is time to face the fact we're looking at the Clico British American debacle, debacle and see where we are and what could happen. We'll be right back with much, much more. To thrive in today's dynamic business environment, you need the right partner. With a partner protecting your interests, you can focus on productivity. It's amazing where the right partnership can develop and how far it can take you. Contact us today. Digicel Business, complete solutions for your needs. For the latest in Caribbean culture, news, sports, and entertainment, tune in to Carib Vision. We keep you up to date on developments in your region. Carib Vision, we broadcast across the Caribbean, in the New York Tri-State area, Canada, and Europe. Carib Vision, the eyes and ears of the Caribbean. If you are serious about business, then log on and participate in Business Advantage. Every Monday, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m., log on to www.niceradio.info. Business Advantage inspires you to believe that the man who wins is the one who thinks he can. Business Advantage with host Jerry George, mentoring the next generation of Caribbean entrepreneurs. 8 to 10 p.m. Mondays on www.niceradio.info. For further information, email Caribbean Information Hub at gmail.com. Like the Business Advantage Facebook page or call 1 784 456 5967 to participate. It's the end of the month again. My son's rent is due. Sending money to your children studying overseas is easy. Western Union's safe and reliable service lets you transfer money everywhere in the world. My son is doing well at school. That makes me proud. Western Union, moving money for better. Agents in Grenada, Rennick Thompson and Company, with locations in Grenville, Sautiers, Guave, Grand Anse, the Carinage, Bruce Street, and Carrier Coo. To thrive in today's dynamic business environment, you need the right partner. Digicel Business is that partner, offering you the flexibility you need to flourish. It's amazing where the right partnership can develop and how far it can take you. Contact us today. Digicel Business, complete solutions for your needs. This edition of Time to Face the Facts, the fact we're looking at this evening is what exactly happened with the Clico British American business and where are the people who invested money in that business. Join us um, via Google Hangout is Mr. Peter Pommel from Trinidad and Tobago. He is the chairman of the policyholders there. Good evening, Peter. Hi, good evening, Jerry. Thanks and for joining uh, us. And good evening to your guests. Is it Kerry Simmons? Kerry Simmons, that's correct. Hello, Peter. Politician is in the house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we, we were, when we started, we looked at, at how this whole thing developed and some of the issues. Uh, we spoke of the fact that, uh, by and large, it is a government failure, a failure of governance. How do you treat with that? Well, clearly, there are, there are a number of factors that would have led to this debacle. Um, governance is just one of those factors, but, but clearly... That is an important factor in the sense that in Trinidad, I'm not too sure what the situation is, uh, what is or was in Barbados, but in Trinidad, what you have is a, the central bank is the regulator for all insurance companies. Prior to that, it was a, a department known as the uh, inspector, um, supervisor of insurance, but it was trans, but insurance companies were transferred from the supervisor of insurance, which was a department in the Ministry of Finance. To the central bank, so the so this uh, collapse occurred under the, the, the watchful eyes of the central bank of Trinidad and Tobago, and clearly, as the main regulator, they either fell asleep on the job or they were looking the other way. Uh, and, I, and I make no apologies for saying that. Which which one you lean most to? <laughs> 
<laughs> I think I think all of the above. All oh. of the above. <laughs> now that because the the then Prime Minister of Antigua um, made yeah. the point that it was really an issue in all of the islands where the people who were supposed to be the regulators just yeah. didn't do the job. Is it that we don't have people competent enough to do this in the region? Uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's not just competence. It's probably a combination of a lack of comp competence and possible, um, I, I want to use my words uh, carefully, possible collusion. And, and let me explain what I mean by that. You, I, I cannot for the life of me understand how you can have a, an organization, a regulator, that is uh, supposed to be regulating and supervising uh, uh, an institution for more than, I would say, more than 10 years. And at no time during that period were they able to detect that there were major issues affecting that insurance company. That is and my problem. Sorry. Sorry? That's, that's my problem. Yes, that, that is the problem. I, I mean, in terms of a regulator, what you have to, what you, every year they're supposed to sign off on renewing the uh, license for them to, to, to practice or to function as an insurance company. And there are certain uh, tests that would have to be done and certain audits would have to be done. And therefore, um, I can't understand for the life of me, year after year, you are signing off and giving them a, a clean bill of health. And then all of a sudden in 2009, you suddenly wake up one morning and realize that this company has a $5 billion hole in its, in its balance sheet and its statutory fund. Something has to be wrong there. Absolutely. I to I'm totally with you on that one. But more importantly is the fact that in, these, in all of these islands, basically speaking, the, the people who were the, in charge of the, the fund seemed to either not know where the fund was, if there was a fund, or what was in the fund, if anything. But going beyond, well, going beyond that, the yeah. auditors must also be fingered in all of this. Absolutely. Uh, sorry, Kerry, you want to say something? No, no, no. Go, go ahead, Peter. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, certainly there, there's no way you can excuse the auditors. Because the way I see it, the first line of defense would be the auditors. Now, re re remember, you have to remember that the people who would have invested money in, the, in Clico, in this insurance company, are regular people. They're ordinary people. And they are going to rely on the auditors. They are going to rely on the regulators. To, to assure them that all is well with this particular institution. And if you have a situation where auditors are signing off also every year on the audited financial statement of the company and indicating that the company is solvent and its financial statements are free from material misstatement uh, due to fraud and what have you, blah, 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 um, that gives the, the public some level of confidence that all is well. Yes. But obviously, we, hindsight will tell us that that confidence was obviously misplaced because something obviously went wrong in the sense that these auditors are also saying that they didn't pick up that something was wrong until 2009. So here you have the auditors, and in this case, PricewaterhouseCoopers, which is supposed to be an internationally repeated auditing firm, is saying to the country, to the public, to the Caribbean, that we did not pick up any issues here with Clico, issues to the extent that would cause us to either qualify those accounts or to or to not um, you know or to or to or to or to make some sort of um, statement regarding those those accounts. And I'm saying that because they miss they missed the, they dropped the ball and then you had a situation where the central bank, second line of defense in my view, they also did not are saying that they didn't pick up any irregularities that would have caused them significant concern. And it was only in 2009 that they realized that something was seriously wrong with the insurance company. Peter, and I'm saying that that is a bit, a bit too much to swallow. Peter, in 2008, the, yes. I have a copy of it here. The balance yes. sheet shows them having, and there was a, a speech that was made saying they had $100 billion in assets. Correct. Correct. A couple of days after... They are going to the central, and they paid themselves dividends in that period. A couple of days after, Correct. the company is declared to be insolvent. Correct. I mean, Correct. I mean, please. Th these are some of the the most 
um, qualified people. Um, yes. As, as Kerry said earlier, we're talking here about the biggest uh, conglomerate in the entire Caribbean. So how could we just allow them to get away so far with not because right now nobody has been asked to, to give an account. Yeah, that is, that is really the big in, in all of this. Because you're talking about this, this issue, this collapse took place in 2009, and we are now in 2015. And the last time I checked, no one, absolutely no one, has been brought to book or held accountable uh, for what has transpired here. As a matter of fact, everybody is now blaming the system. Yes. There's a gentleman called the system <laughs> that gets all the blame when it's things like this. <laughs> As if the system ran itself. <laughs> but l let me give you three comments that, that stick out to me. Yes. The first of them was by the former um, governor of the Central Bank, who was the governor in situ at the time, Mr. Ewart Williams. Yes. He yes. called it a massive fraud on the public. In yes. a letter to the Attorney General, the DPP, when he was called into the case, said yes. it looks like last city. Yes. And somebody else has called it the perfect crime. I mean, every single case tells us that there is something criminal about what has happened here. And yet nothing yes. has, has taken place. Yeah, I, I tell you, that is the elephant in the room. You, you, you have all the people who are supposed to have a say in, in what has transpired here. No one has taken any action. From the, as a fact, in Trinidad and Tobago, the DPP was trying, as you know, we had a commission of inquiry, the Santa Woman of Inquiry. And the DPP was actually trying to shut down the commission of inquiry because he's saying that that was going to interfere with any criminal proceedings that maybe we have been brought against certain, certain people, uh, key people within the organization. And, and we are talking about that commission of inquiry. The last hearing they had was in, I think it was in May 2013. Uh, and as, as I said, this issue, uh, the collapse came in 2009, and to date, neither the DPP nor have we seen any report from the Sir Anthony Coleman Commission of Inquiry after months uh, uh, of um, testimony uh, uh, you know, was, was put forward uh, at the Commission. You had dozens of lawyers who got millions and millions of dollars for, for, for their participation, and to date, we have not had that report. So it begs the question, what is really going on here? And by the way, so the key protagonists in this issue, they're living in Miami, sipping margaritas on yachts and so on, and they couldn't be bothered. They re, as a fact, they refused to come back to Trinidad to take part in the Commission of Inquiry to give evidence, to at least explain in, in, to their understanding what transpired in the Commission of It's It's really, I mean, it's scary. I see. I'm going to carry now, Peter. No, sure, sure. When did, when did Barbados really understand the full import of what was happening here? In your case, it's just $400 million, it looks like. It was in January of 2009. And that was the time at which, uh, just after the announcement in Trinidad and Tobago of the true state of their situation, that hastily put together press conferences were, 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 were done here. And uh, we were given the assurance that Clico Barbados was a separate entity, which is true. It is true, yes. And that by extension, it was prudently managed and well run, and that there was absolutely no issue in that by extension, the Eastern Caribbean, which are all, all of the, the Clico branches in the Eastern Caribbean are branches, external branches of the Barbados company. Um, uh, were equally well run and that investors and, and depositors' money were safe. That was the, the, the line that was thrown out. Well, in fact, a private just was employed <coughs> to go from country to country to carry that message. Uh, there you go. But, again, the reality of where we have failed as a region is in the critical point that Peter is making, which is the one I wanted to make before the break. And I go a little bit further, Peter. Perhaps I can because I am part of the quote-unquote, political structure. I say this, there is a duty of, of care. There's a, we, we have an obligation as legislators to protect the public. And I think that what has happened in this situation is that CLICO is so big 
and it has touched so many people who are quote unquote big ups in the Caribbean society that there is a feeling, boy, you better take your hand off of this. You can't really, you know, it is the 800 pound elephant really? in the room, but you can't touch it because you will offend. I think that it is important to send a signal that persons who did wrong, and it is patently obvious that a lot of people did wrong and benefited from that wrongdoing in substantial ways, should be treated in the same way as we would treat the fellow who puts on a ski mask and put two holes in it and, and decide that he's going and hold up a, uh, a, an old lady on the corner. Mm -hmm. But that is not what we're doing. So that the issue of accountability, and, and, and in Barbados it is particularly worrisome because it is also associated with the taint of absolute fraud. Remember that the $3.33 million that was moved through the, law, the former law offices of the former prime minister was by way of a false invoice. Mm -hmm. The judicial manager has done all of the forensic audits on the, 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 the data and meta, metadata associated with the generation of that invoice, and it is completely false. The, the person, one party named as a beneficiary of money um, for legal fees, a Queen's Council in Barbados, has indicated that not only did he not see any such fee, but he knows nothing of the transaction about which the bill is, is supposed to be relating. So that when you have that kind of situation take place, then the question that now has to be asked is why were the, law, the legal authorities not moved to take the necessary action to, call, to bring, bring to, 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 to account the participants in this matter? Now, I would agree that one participant, unfortunately, is not alive, so therefore, he can't, he can't be heard to say anything. But there are others, and there are other people who would, to all intents and purposes, be seen as the beneficiary, even the beneficiary of his estate. Because you have to trace the funds, and, and, and without wanting to hold beneficiaries of his estate liable for wrongdoing, we need to know where Clico's money went, and why it went where it went. So that there, there seems to me to be a, a chronic failure um, to follow through. And I think this is the point that Peter is making because similar, similarly in Trinidad, that has not happened either. And they went so far as to have a commission of inquiry. Um, you would expect that coming out of a commission of inquiry, there would be substantive recommendations being made. And if, again, if we fail to treat these things seriously, and you have the papi show, you know, which is just mama guy and people, about a commission of inquiry and so on. Which is a very expensive undertaking. An expensive, und but nothing ever comes out of it. Then people lose confidence in the system. And, and, no, but and, how do you, how do you, the man on the street who might very well be in a very desperate position, who commits a crime. Yes. He is splashed across the front pages of the newspaper. Precisely. He is made to be seen the worst thing. How do you as a society look that man in the eye and say to him, you are a criminal. And that is the reason why I, I abhor and deprecate in the strongest possible terms the approach that has been taken, certainly in Barbados. Let, let, let me say something, and, and Peter might bring back Peter in on this too. Um, Peter, you call this, in one of your statements, the most egregious example of mismanagement. Um, you want to expand on that, Peter? Well, it, it goes beyond the mismanagement uh, in the sense that the, 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 you, there's, there's an extent to which you can mismanage something, and then beyond that, it becomes a crime. It, 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 you know, it's, 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 it's criminal negligence at best, and it's um, larceny, as, as, as the DPP put it, at, at, at the worst. So, so that, um, and, and let me just make this point, uh, 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 take off on what Kerry is saying. Now, the irony of this situation is that in the U.S., you had a situation where both Bernie Madoff uh, who, who is that big Ponzi scheme, as you would recall, he is now doing a, a jail term of over 100 and something years. And his matter was brought to trial in, in a matter of months. He was tried and convicted, and he's now serving his time. In the case of Sir Alan Stanford in Antigua, a similar situation would have occurred. Within months, he was, he was arrested, brought to trial, convicted, and he's now serving a, a very lengthy jail term. In, in, in Trinidad, I, and I, from what I'm hearing in Barbados, it seems as though some, I think one of you, I think it's Kerry, you said it earlier on, yeah, the question of two, it's not too big to, 
to uh, to fail to control. Too big to yes. Too big to be. Did you say that? Too big, too big to be regulated. To be controlled. Yeah. To be too big to regulate. Well, I want to introduce another one. It's too. It's a question of too big to jail. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Too big it's, to jail. <laughs> Because these, some of these, they, you know, the whole animal farm, some people are more, all of us are equal, but some are more equal than others. True. There are some people that are untouchable, and, and, you know, and, and they exist on all parts of the Caribbean. So that regardless of what they do, they are never to book. And that's the question, whole question of the white collar crime versus the blue collar crime is what Jerry was talking about. Uh, How do you tell the guy who stole chocolate in, in uh, the supermarket, who's going to get six months? Six months jail, uh, almost immediately, and the guy who's stealing billions of dollars, he is there uh, having Queen's Council and Senior Council drag his matter on for years, and eventually gets off on a technicality. I mean, it's really, it's a sad situation. And the willingness to enforce has been, or the lack of willingness to enforce law, because, I mean, there are laws already on, 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 the, books. on the books, so, you know, there is a very strong feeling that money had to have been laundered if you're going to move it the way it was moved via the, the, the law offices. There is a very strong feeling that the generation of an invoice that is proven to be untrue and, and baseless in fact has to be treated as a matter of fraud. There is a very strong feeling that if a law office is allowed to close, and you know it is closing, but you do not seek to do the tracing of the necessary documents before it closes and the, the, the paperwork dissipates into thin air, that you have failed to follow well-established legal principles and practices. But all of these things happened. And, and the, the concern really is that it could not and would not have been happening that way if people who are deemed to be lesser lights in the community were involved. But, but listen, listen to one of the things that I, that I find objectionable. In some places, the governments now want to assume the role of knight in shining armor on behalf of the investors. So they want to appear now to be the ones who are diligently doing something, you know, speaking tough uh, because they're doing something. I have not heard a single government of the region acknowledge the fact that they failed in their responsibility with respect to the statutory funds and regulation. Not one. And I agree with you. And as I say to you, I think that the, 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 the mistake is compounded. And I say mistake advisedly. The negligence is compounded by virtue of the fact that the governments in CARICOM have at their disposal one immediate tool which could be adopted across this region to try to make sure that even though the, 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 this particular horse has fled the stable, another one of similar or worse proportions does not once again wreak havoc. Mm -hmm. The idea of having a financial services agreement. Ag agreement translated from agreement stage into law and, in, um, and put into effect across CARICOM is absolutely critical. Hold there, hold yeah. there. We'd like to hold you on bricks. We take it on a break at this point <laughs> in time. This is time to face the facts. And we're looking at this very troubling subject of what happened to Clico and British American and where the people's money. Don't go away, we'll be right back. To thrive in today's dynamic business environment, you need the right partner. Digicel Business is that partner offering you the flexibility you need to flourish. Our scalable solutions will increase your effectiveness and efficiency while enabling workforce mobility. Large or small, you can hide from potential threats to your business. With a partner protecting your interests, you can focus on productivity. It's amazing where the right partnership can develop and how far it can take you. Contact us today. Digicel Business, complete solutions for your needs. If you are serious about business, then log on and participate in Business Advantage. Every Monday, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m., log on to www.niceradio.info. Business Advantage inspires you to believe that the man who wins is the one who thinks he can. Business Advantage with host Jerry George, mentoring the next generation of Caribbean entrepreneurs. 8 to 10 p.m. Mondays on www.niceradio.info. For further information, 
email Caribbean Information Hub at gmail.com. Like the Business Advantage Facebook page or call 1 784 456 5967 to participate. For the latest in Caribbean culture, news, sports, and entertainment, tune in to Carib Vision. We keep you up to date on developments in your region. Carib Vision, we broadcast across the Caribbean, in the New York tri state area, Canada, and Europe. Carib Vision, the eyes and ears of the Caribbean. When you send money with the Western Union, you're sending a smile, a gift, a hello or even support. It's a fast and convenient way to stay connected with loved ones around the world or even across the Caribbean. From any of our convenient agent locations, depend on Western Union to send your money quickly and reliably. Western Union, moving money for better. Agents in Grenada, Rennick Thompson and Company, with locations in Grenville, Sotiers, Guave, Grenans, the Carinade, Bruce Street, and Carrier Coo. Welcome back to this edition of Time to Face the Facts, looking again at what happened to all of those people's monies that simply seem to have disappeared into thin air that they invested. Uh, Peter, you are representing the policyholders in Trinidad and Tobago. Could you give us a yeah. sense of what it means for the average person investor and what has been the experience and some of what you well, face? Yeah, that's a good question, um, Jerry. Uh, it's been a horror story, potentially. Um, what you have is a situation where you have people who would have worked all their lives, saved their money. As I, as I said in the commissionary inquiry, you were told, um, go to school, learn your lesson, pass your exams, get a job, save your money, save your money, invest it in a, in a, in a, in a reputable institution. And that is what most of these um, policyholders did. Or at least they thought they did in terms of investing in people. And what you had is a situation where they, 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 most of them ignore, ignored Rule 101 in terms of investing, which is don't put all your eggs in one basket. Most of them would have put all their life savings into people. And as a result of that, the whole idea was that they were going to live off the interest. I think that was the goal that you put, a, put aside this money for when you're in the twilight of your years, you can sit back and live off the income from your savings. And what happened? Some of them had children who were going to attending university abroad. They had to take them out of, of university. They, they had to sell their homes and move in with their adult children. They, they, I mean, they had to sell their vehicles. They, 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 some of them uh, couldn't buy medication for their chronic illnesses, and you know, they, at that that age, you tend to, to you know, to, to, to have more costly medical bills and so on. I mean, they list, and some of them actually died. Um, on Jerry and and Kerry, some of them, uh, you know, the stress, just this mere stress of knowing that you you could lose all your money, or you're in a situation where you are likely to lose all your money, is enough to kill you. So that um, you know, it is really a horror story. And, and, and the list goes on in terms of some of the, you know, the... What about the psychological... You your rules as it were. What about the psychological um, impact it has had on some, a lot of these people? Good question again. Um, it has certainly had a negative impact in terms of investor confidence, uh, if, if you want to look at it from that perspective, because uh, the case in point is Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, I'm sure you would have read in the newspaper that the banks in Trinidad and Tobago are awash with, with money. There's a serious, serious liquidity overhang in the country, and but yet the, um, the interest rate on on on, um, on loans uh, 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 keep going up uh, rather than coming down, and and at the same time you not you don't have anybody borrowing the money, which is contributing to the liquidity overhang. So that clearly what is is a situation is that most of the those persons who would have invested in people they are now gun shy. They are now either saving their money under their mattress or they are investing in very safe, extremely safe investments where you don't get much of return, which doesn't really add to the GDP and so on. So that it is, it has had the investor confidence has taken a serious hit. Uh, and as I, I always like to say, in confidence is a thing that you can't put your finger on, but you know when it's not there. And as far as I'm concerned, investor confidence has not yet been restored to Trinidad and Tobago. Hence the reason we are experiencing the, the, the financial uh, environment that we are experiencing right now. 
So that, but if you look at it from that perspective, it has had a serious psychological impact on the on the investor on the on the investor. But let, let, me, let me say something here. And just to say to our viewers, the numbers are on the screen. We'd love to hear from you. Give us a call because I'm sure that many of you are part and parcel of this problem. But let me say something. I've heard two sets of central bank governors literally turn around and say, you know what? I blame the investors. They should have known better. But I, I, I contest that. And here's why. We are not living in a... In a, in a uh, uh, an environment where like for example in North America where people are accustomed to investment and stocks and so forth and so people thought okay if this company is offering us this rate of interest the governments are not saying anything and in fact going beyond that the NIS of a lot of these countries has also lost money in this debacle so if the government itself has failed why are we blaming the little person who thought they were doing the best things, the best thing that they could. Well, First, let me hear Kerry, and then go to you, Peter. Well, Jerry, I think that that's a very critical question, and I, I, I kind of had hoped that you would ask something like that because you know what has also not been said or discussed much in Barbados <clears throat> is the fact that it is beyond dispute that the supervisor of insurance actually, at a number of stages at least three or four that I know of, indicated in writing to Clico that the executive flexible premium annuity, which is the one that is attracting the greatest degree of, I suppose, contempt from governments when they say that investors should have known better, when even as you quite yeah, rightly when, made when the point... in one country, you, the government invests 69 well, million dollars you, how could the government that's you, what i'm saying you made, you the very government valid is passing the buck precisely because nis schemes have been in, put into it national insurance schemes you have credit unions, credit unions. who have, have put their money into it lots of public enterprises statutory corporations across the eastern caribbean and indeed in barbados have been involved in it and corporations of a private nature of high standing have been involved but let me make the point the supervisor of insurance in Barbados issued notices that these things, one, did not appear to conform to the basic requirements of an annuity. Secondly, that they were deeply concerned about the, the, the way in which the process was operating and that they should no longer be issued. In fact, before the court right now is a collateral matter relating to the fact that these annuities continue to be sold in spite of the fact... You mean now? No, no, continue oh, then, continue then. Okay. to be sold in spite of the fact that the stop order was issued by the supervisor. Now, what I, I fail to, get, uh, to understand is how is it possible that a supervisor can issue not one but two or three notices that this should not be happening. It continues to happen. But you don't rein in the problem. You wait until it has reached crisis stage and, and catastrophic proportions across the region. And then you say, oh dear, but you know, we had told these people not to do that. No, that can't be right. And, and again, this is one of the areas where I say to you, there has been a chronic failure of regulatory um, involvement. And, and the regulator either lacked the, what the, the, the Americans would call, or the Mexican-Americans would call the cojones, <laughs> yes. uh, the, the testicular fortitude to do that which it had to do, or then they, they as you say, dropped to sleep on, on the job. But, but one has to ask the question, what did St. Lucia know that the rest of the region didn't know? And do we look at the regulators in St. Lucia and say, and ask them, what were the red flags that you saw that stop St. Lucians, them encouraging St. Lucians to become part of this. I think that is, a, that's, that is something that should be pursued. Well, perhaps, perhaps. As I tell you, though, I, I believe that behind the scenes, Jerry, this thing went beyond just the regulator. I think that in many instances, the, regu the office of the regulator was overshadowed by the political master. And I know for a fact that in several instances in this region, the political master walked hand in hand with the, the, the patriarchs of 
Clico. And, and you know, perhaps it is because of the size of the region, but it is one of the things that we have to find regular, um, legislative ways of guarding against this happening, where you can have a private entity that has become so powerful and it reaches, it reaches so deep into the political process that it can affect the judgment which should be executed in the interests of and on behalf of the ordinary man and well, woman let me, let me in tell the you Caribbean. Another question, and Peter, maybe you'll have an opinion on this too and after. You have a situation where these annuities are sold. Who, especially government, who is getting the commission? Peter? Who's getting the commission from the annuity? Listen, if I am selling, if the government is selling, right? This is a business yeah. deal. It's based on commissions. So who is collecting the commissions for that which was sold by the government? You mean the Greek money that the government invested? Yes, in yes, people? yes. Who was well, the well, person, who was the person driving that, that whole procedure? Well, that is a, that, that is a billion dollar question you're asking, Jerry. <laughs> this is one that we need to pursue. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's something that we need to, we need to look into. But let me just go back to some of the things you all touched on. You, you all touched on the question of regulatory failure, the question of political patronage, and the question of whether policy... Okay, uh, Peter, if you just hold for me, please. We have a first call from St. Lucia, and I'm glad sure. it's St. Lucia calling. St. Lucia, go ahead, okay. please. Not St. Lucia, I think this is St. Vincent. Oh, St. Vincent, Vincent, sorry, okay. Yeah, the horse is already bolted. I'm surprised that you're still talking about this. As though nothing can be done about or done with the culprits, if, if that may be too much of a nice word to call them. And I was wondering if they didn't have investment in the United States of America and if the U.S. Um, authorities could not take some action, if we in the Caribbean are too small or because of our dirty politics, you know, and as you said, the tentacles have spread far and wide into all the politics or uh, governments in the Caribbean. If there isn't some other authority to, to deal with, with to deal with these camps, I make no apologies for that. Instead of just talking, talking, I mean, because I am surprised to hear this talk come up. I mean, I have people close. Thank God I wasn't so stupid to invest my whatever the funds I had in, into that kind of thing. Because not all of us are greedy and liquid, eh? But I have people so close to me who have lost no, real no, sorry, money. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I am not, I'm not going to entertain this concept of people being greedy and liquid. I'm sorry. Well, I'm not I mean, entertaining that. I, hear you. I mean, in I terms hear you. of the investors, eh? I'm talking about in the people who invested. The people but who invested. But the government caught up in it. So well, exactly. Even the government are caught up in it. I want to know if they are not part of a scheme. I listen to your response, and you said enough. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just want to make that point. I do not want to call the investors greedy. They might have been misinformed and all the rest of it, but ultimately, they were acting based on information that they considered bona fide. I, I agree with you. And I, I think that there is, there is a reason why this kind of thinking is being spread. Because if you can get a buy-in on the view that, oh, these people greedy man and they should have known better to go and think. Um, it lets certain people off the hook. Exactly. And it can justify what has really been put forward as the solution in Barbados. Mm -hmm. Because really, you know, what has been put before our courts is not a solution that at all addresses the situation in the Eastern Caribbean. Don't mind a lot of long oh, talk at the very beginning about how Barbados will, because the branches are external mm -hmm. branches of a Barbados company, you know, Barbados is going to be there in part and parcel of any solution in Eastern Caribbean. That was so at the beginning. But when you had to start to put money where your mouth is, all of a sudden there is no Eastern Caribbean proposal so that we have a Barbados first proposal, which in fact is a Barbados only proposal. But you have to understand why that is too. And, and Peter might... Peter might comment on this. You have a situation where um, the approach in the Eastern Caribbean was quickly to jump to judicial management. Yeah. 
Peter, how did you get your, 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 your policyholders together? Because that is an issue that I feel very strongly about, that there has been a lack of leadership in bringing people together to, to, to deal with this. Peter? Well, we, we had a similar... The thing about it is, when the news broke about the spiritual collapse, based on the... I'm getting some interference, so let me just... Uh, are you hearing me? Yes, you go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I, I was saying, when the collapse came in 2009, and the, the, the political... Um, speak went out to, to suggest that people were greedy, they took a risk, they should have known better. That was the same thing that was being said in Trinidad. A lot of people were feeling ashamed to be people policy owners. Would you believe that? Yes. Some people actually came up to me and, and they didn't even want to identify as a people policy owner because they somehow felt responsible for what happened to them. You know that you know that the battered wife syndrome that you always feel that you caused it. Peter, well, Peter, to... just hold. We have another call, and it, the, what we do on the program is that we tend to give calls preference. So, caller from St. Vincent again, go ahead, please. Hello? Yes, good night, good night, Jerry, and to the other two gentlemen. Now, this matter is regional, huh? The, the fraud was committed regional. Yep. Trinidad and Barbados were the main headquarters of Clico and British Americans. And I don't want to separate Clico from British Americans. Now, now you have the situation with British Americans. Please listen, listen to your phone, please. When Clico you... took over British American with a promissory note that was never paid. Mm -hmm. Please listen to your phone. And this company, British American, had liquidity. And it appears that the, the management in Trinidad just attached a vacuum like a vacuum cleaner machine and suck out the liquidity from British American in the islands. And then Trinidad is taking the position that the laws only give protection to citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. While citizens of the uh, caller, Caribbean. Caller, 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 we'll have to cut the call if, because you, you need to listen to your phone. You're listening to whatever else yeah. there is. Okay. You need to listen so only to your phone. All right, okay. Okay. But we understand, okay. it. we get your question All right. anyway. So okay. we have the situation where Trinidad, I feel, is responsible because they have taken over the assets in Trinidad and they are managing those assets and some of them, I believe, is generating income and there should be some long-term program. You're going back to listening, not your phone again. Listen to your phone, please. Okay, the call seems to have, fought, have dropped. Okay, um, Peter, Trinidad yes. is being fingered here. What's your response? Well, in the case of Baiku, um, Baiku is insolvent in Trinidad, which is British American Trinidad, and it is insolvent, uh, from what I understand, of the islands and, and, and so on. Now, the general is making a point that, that people took out the assets um, when, they, when they initially bought Baiku. While that, 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 there is some truth in that, I know you had done an interview with um, a former um, chairman, I hope, president of Baiku, Mr. Branca, Brian Branca, was it, um, Jerry? Yeah, Brian Branca, yes. And, and he has you. made some of those points. But one of the major problems that affected by was the question of a, of a major land purchase in, in, in Florida, Osceola County to be exact, where they purchased some 6,000 acres of swamp land, some 300 uh, plus million US dollars. And to date, they have not been able to, to see the benefits of that particular transaction. As a matter of fact, 
my understanding is that that transaction will be for the courts in Florida and certain um, key personnel of both Baiku and Kiku have been identified as defendants in that particular matter. So it's not a, it's an oversimplification to say that Trinidad um, would have, have would have assets relative to Baiku uh, and therefore Trinidad is somehow responsible responsible. Uh, that is an oversimplification. Let me, just make, let, let me make a point on that, on that figure you just gave. 301 yeah. EC million, million EC dollars was taken from the branches in the Eastern Caribbean to fund that same intercompany transaction which included the purchase of those same lands in Florida. 301 yeah. million dollars. And it is wow. believed that that one transaction is really what took the company down ultimately. That is correct. That is absolutely correct, Jerry. And, 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 and you have to find out who were the directors at, at the time in Baiko who would have signed off on such a decision because my understanding is that that one transaction, that single transaction, was larger than the total asset base of Baiko. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, that, it, it just makes no sense. But it's not, it, it goes beyond making no sense. How could... <laughs> I, it's, it's laughable, right? Because... How could they be entering into a transaction when they don't have the assets, the money? It's, yeah. it, this, is, this is just beyond criminal, you know. And as you said, <clears throat> those guys are still walking around. They're having a good time. They, you know, they, they're attending all these functions and cocktail parties and so on. But, you know, it's incredible. It's, the, 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 the caller, Peter, was also making a point which I think goes to the issue of the fairness of any solution. Because yeah. I think he is, he is drawing our attention to the fact that, okay, a lot of what took place took place in the jurisdiction of Trinidad and Tobago, first, Barbados, second. The policyholder or a depositor investor in the Eastern Caribbean, for example, um, would really have had to deal with the fallout, though they were not at the, the core of what was taking place. Now, if you look, put yourself in the shoes of a policyholder in the Eastern Caribbean, I think one of the things that you would have to recognize is that, first of all, as regards Barbados, not necessarily Trinidad now, but as regards Barbados, they are pretty much co-equals in terms of the number of the policyholders and also the size of the commitments or obligations which have to be honored. The Eastern Caribbean is perhaps almost equal to Barbados. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the concern really has to be, and certainly is for me, the fact that only $31 million has been ring-fenced in the Barbados First Plan. The only, to the extent that it speaks to the Eastern Caribbean at all, it ring fences $31 million of real estate assets yeah. held by Clico in Barbados. Now, that clearly falls well short. That can't even I mean begin to put a, 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 an not imprint. Not even a dent. dent. Uh, yeah, well, let's, not let's even a dent. The usual break on you. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is time to face the facts, and we're dealing with a very, very serious subject this evening. Uh, we hope that you will give us a call, uh, because I'm sure you have something to share. We'll be right back. We've got lots more for you. If you are serious about business, then log on and participate in Business Advantage. Every Monday, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m., log on to www.niceradio.info. Business Advantage inspires you to believe that the man who wins is the one who thinks he can. Business Advantage with host Jerry George, mentoring the next generation of Caribbean entrepreneurs. 8 to 10 p.m. Mondays on www.niceradio.info. For further information, email caribbeaninformationhub at gmail.com. Like the Business Advantage Facebook page or call 1-784-456-5967 to participate. It's the end of the month again. My son's rent is due. Sending money to your children studying overseas is easy. Western Union's safe and reliable service lets you transfer money everywhere in the world. 
My son is doing well at school. That makes me proud. Western Union, moving money for better. Agents in Grenada, Rennick Thompson and Company, with locations in Grenville, Sauteurs, Guave, Grand Anse, The Carnage, Bruce Street, and Cariacou. To thrive in today's dynamic business environment, you need the right partner. Digicel Business is that partner, offering you the flexibility you need to flourish. It's amazing where the right partnership can develop and how far it can take you. Contact us today. Digicel Business, complete solutions for your needs. For the latest in Caribbean culture, news, sports, and entertainment, tune in to Carib Vision. We keep you up to date on developments in your region. Carib Vision. We broadcast across the Caribbean, in the New York Tri-State area, Canada, and Europe. Carib Vision, the eyes and ears of the Caribbean. To thrive in today's dynamic business environment, you need the right partner. With a partner protecting your interests, you can focus on productivity. It's amazing where the right partnership can develop and how far it can take you. Contact us today. Digicel Business, complete solutions for your needs. Welcome back to this edition of Time to Face the Facts. And we are looking at the question of Clico, British American, what happened to the people's money? Well, so shortly after this had happened, I had spoken at an interview with the governor of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, Sir Dwight Venner. And this is what he had to say about the arrangement then. First of all, you have an agency arrangement where the, the company is resident elsewhere and should have a regulator. How much resources do you put into regulation of an agency where there's a company that is the main body, hmm? where you have so many competing claims by the population? Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing is um, some of the products being offered by these institutions, uh, when you look at them on the face of it, um, in an environment where interest rates are reasonably low, and you have interest rates which are out of that zone, then people make choices about these things. But hold on. Hmm. I agree with that. Hmm. But well, I haven't finished. I know, but it is so No, no, I haven't finished making my point. No. And so therefore, there is something in the industry that says, buyer will well. If you've been offered an interest rate of 9 or 10 percent, and obviously, whoever is granting that to you has been making hmm, 15 or 16 percent in a low interest rate environment. Well, that's him saying that as I put, you heard it, Peter, did you? I heard most of it. Most of it, I right. It. But you notice he stopped me to make the point of, of um, buyer beware. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 Which is now becoming the mantra. Let me, let me address this. There are two issues I want to address that, that one way one of your followers raised and this whole question of um, uh, the policy will just took a risk and they should have known better. Let me deal with the issue of the, the, the question as to, I'm getting the sense that some of the callers or this particular caller is trying to ascribe some responsibility to Trinidad, Clico Trinidad, uh, relative to what is happening in, in terms of payments to persons in um, the Eastern Caribbean and in Barbados. That's what uh, do you get that sense, Terry? Yes, but I, not, I, I, not only does he get that impression, but that has, yes. been a stra that has been something that has been preached. All right, right. Let me, let, let me, let me say this. And preach from, preach from okay. high up. Okay, let me, let me say, well, Dwight is making the point about agency status. That is a separate issue. But let me address this question of, in, in, and, 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 I, and I'm not totally familiar with, with the Barbados situation, but I have a good idea because I, I chat with, um, what's the name, June Fowler from time to time, and I get a sense of what is happening there. Now, the thing about it is, CIL, which was the, the, the name, I think, uh, the acronym for the CLICO uh, setup in, in Barbados, 
they were supposed to be a they, they, they are not a subsidiary of Clico Trinidad. And that's the first point I want to make. Mm -hmm. That was supposed to be a standalone arrangement where, where they are linked to Clico, but they are not a subsidiary per se, not a 100% own subsidiary of, of Clico. That's correct. Uh, now, so they're in, not just an terms, agency. So they're not just an agency like in the, in, in the rest of the, the islands. No, 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 no. They're not an agency. And, 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 the, and how I'm going to make this point is, in terms of the legislation in Trinidad, you, you made mention of this, this fund called the statutory fund. Now, all insurance companies in Trinidad and Tobago must set up what is known as a statutory fund. Now, that fund is, is, is set up to match the liability. So each dollar worth of liability that a company writes in terms of its insurance business, it is supposed to back that liability with a dollar worth of assets in this statutory fund. To deal with situations very similar to what has occurred in terms of the collapse. So in the event of a collapse, there would be sufficient assets in the statutory fund to match the liabilities of the policy holder. And hence, it makes it probably the safest investment that an investor could make, unlike the banks, where you have the deposit insurance regime in Trinidad and Tobago, where you only get up to, right now, I think we are at $125,000 you are guaranteed up to $125,000. But if you, let's say, had $500,000 and the bank went belly up, you would only get back or you only guarantee $125,000. In the case of an insurance company in Trinidad and Tobago, and I'm not too sure if the, I think it's the, the same. islands are the same. Available. Sorry? The islands are the, the same statutory. The same. Now, now, that system will only work if the regulators are doing their job. So, so that, is the, 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 that is predicated on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the basis that the regulators are, are performing their regulatory function and their supervisory function in, in a very efficient and effective manner. But we all know that that did not occur. Otherwise, we would not be talking about Clinco now because it, it would have meant that the statutory fund would have been fully funded and therefore all the policyholders would have been able to be, have been paid their money when the collapse came. Well, if even, so, they, if even they weren't paid all of their money, the haircut would have not been 10 cents on no, a dollar. No, no, no. no, they would, because if you have a dollar worth of it assets to match your, your liabilities, what it means, you get 100% back of your money. And let me also say, in terms of the type of the asset quality or the type of assets that the insurance company can invest in, that is also prescribed by law. Peter, just hold it, for me, please. We have a call, and as I said to you, we always give our callers preference. Call from Grenada. Good evening. You know, what you and your panelists are talking about really sound like a pot of mashup soup. The people who should have guided this process, the regulators, fell down big time on the job. Don't know what they were regulating, but not keep a bike off for sure, because they were allowed to do whatever they want. And now for the governor of the ECCB and other people in authority to be saying people should have known better. It just brings to mind, so this is how our government who like to talk about protecting the people, protect the people. So we could use the same argument when they allow people to go and build houses in areas where the soil is not good. And when the houses collapse, you tell the people they should have known better. <laughs> You know, and these things happen, and then they want to take a hands-off approach and leave the people out there and say, all of you should have known better. Well, I agree with them, and to an extent, you know, the people should know better because they have been taking so much stupidness from people in authority. Take it, roll over, play dead. And right now it looks like a lot of money dead, and nobody ain't getting back a dime because nothing which is happening currently in FICO seems to be in the interest of the policyholders. And maybe a guest from Trinidad could talk about how easy or how difficult it's going to be for any of these policyholders in any island to see any money coming back in their hand anytime soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> you see, she has gone to the heart of this agency thing that Dwight than I just spoke about. And, and Peter, I think that the real crux of the matter is this. For the Eastern Caribbean, I think they see 
themselves as agents more so yeah. of Barbados because remember oh, Barbados. yes okay. because Barbados is the 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 company like head office precisely yeah and there are right. external branches of the Barbados yeah. in fact that is how they are registered yeah, as the external is. branches of the of the Clico Barbados right. the the concern really though has to be for the Eastern Caribbean that the solution which is now being canvassed in Barbados does not exclude does not include them and okay. as I was saying before we had the last break the 31 million dollars that is ring fenced of Clico's assets yeah. is really a drop in the in the ocean Nothing. can't yeah. go anywhere so that uh, to compound the matter for the Eastern Caribbean then not only is there inadequate assets being being uh, set aside in Barbados but you also have a question of what do you do about these vexatious um, EFPAs now I hear Dwight basically is suggesting that everybody wanted to go to heaven but nobody want to die <laughs> you know that we all run behind the, the big interest rate I hear the point he's yeah. making but in the end of the day even the solution is discriminatory because the, the judicial manager here is also the judicial manager for the Eastern Caribbean exactly and the judicial manager here has put his weight behind a policy a, a solution which is saying okay we will give individuals holding an executive flexible premium annuity um, all the money remember last there's a call from St. Lucia oh go ahead. No, it's a call from Dominica Dominica okay yes. I'm sorry go ahead Dominica the question I want to ask I've been listening to you all and you all say St. Lucia knew something that the rest didn't know why isn't someone from St. Lucia on the panel to tell us what they knew that perhaps then that will come direct to the source of it getting these panels uh, is never a simple matter never oh. Okay, then. Thank you. Thank you. All right. But what I was saying was that the individual holding an executive premium annuity is supposed to get all of his money back, and he will continue to be treated in the event that there's a failing with the new company's ability to, 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 to deliver. He, he still has the benefit of a government guarantee, so he's treated as though he's a creditor. Right. But the, 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 the company now, um, for example, the statutory entity in Dominica or in St. Vincent or even in Barbados is going to be treated differently and the statutory entity in Barbados is going to be treated as though look um, you all will at best get preferential shares and so you become shareholders which is a completely different arrangement a shareholder can sue under any contract uh -huh. that pre-existed and you understand why they have gone down that road but I understand clearly and 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 you you change that arrangement to the detriment I think or to the disadvantage of the persons who are falling under the umbrella of those corporate entities many of whom have the pensions tied up in that so that I, I and I, again I think that this goes to the heart of corporate insolvency the, the law on corporate insolvency dictates that there should be equality of treatment <laughs> of shareholder of, of claimants of the same class and all of these people are of the same class. You have another call. Caller. Good evening, caller. Hello. Yes, good evening. Yes. Uh, now, you all, in your discussion, you raise issues about the auditors yes. and the directors. Yeah. Now, if the auditors issued management letter, what did the directors go about the management letter? And if the auditors did not issue management letters, then the auditors, auditing firms, could be held liable. And also the directors, if the auditors had issued the management letters and the directors failed to act on it, the directors who benefited from funds transfers should be made accountable. Thank you. And I, one other thing before I go, I want to go back to the British American situation and Trinidad because Trinidad has taken over the assets and they're managing the assets with the ethanol company, with the what used to be the Barclays Bank. And so so they they're managing these assets and so from the profits generating from these assets. Trinidad should 
take some responsibility to satisfy the British American things and the OECS. Thank you. PT, he's back at it. Uh, is it any clearer? Yeah, no, no, no. I want to make this point before, before you any more call. In the, the situation in Trinidad is such that, as I told you, there are people who would have bought insurance business, insurance contracts, in, EFPA contracts in Trinidad and Tobago, who are not Trinidad and Tobago national. Mm -hmm. And we, we have made provision in, in, the, in the people resolution plan to settle those policyholders. All it means, though, is that they are not covered by the statutory fund. And I don't know if, you, if you're aware, um, um, Jerry and um, Terry, the, the latest in Trinidad and Tobago, the central bank governor, Mr. Joala Rambaran, has said on the 27th of March that people is now solvent and its statutory fund is now fully funded. And one of the statements that he issued, and I'll just read it for you, he said, um, a third, we spoke about the first partial distribution which will be made to the Trinidad and Tobago policyholders and the government. And then he goes on to talk about a third distribution from the realization of other assets to meet liabilities outside of the statutory fund to mutual fund holders and non-residential TIP. And it's TIP already the EFP as they're talking about. EFP holders, including the government, as a signing of the rights of the mutual fund holders and non-residential EFP holders who accepted the government's offer. So what he's really saying here is that Anybody who, who, who is not a Trinidad and Tobago national, but who would have bought a policy in Trinidad and Tobago is going to be sorted out in due course. What, what he's not talking about are those persons who would have bought insurance uh, products from entities that are, let's, uh, that, uh, that have no connection, well, not have no connection, but are not directly linked to Trinidad and Tobago Clico. I wonder if I'm, I'm making myself clear. Question now, does that then include the Barbados Clico? No, 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 it doesn't. No, it doesn't because okay. those persons would have bought their insurance policies in Barbados from CIL. What we are talking about is let's say a Barbados um, uh, a national came to Trinidad and purchased an insurance product, whether it's an EFP or whatever. That person, while they are not covered under our statutory fund, because by law it says that you must be a a Trinidad and Tobago policy will have to be covered by the statutory fund. Nonetheless, they are covered by Clico's assets. So after that, the persons have been sorted out with it relative to the statutory fund, the Trinidad and Tobago nationals. Then we go to the non-resident persons who will then be You follow? I, I, I follow you. The, th the thing is that we have a situation here now where the... In fact, let, let me just play... So Dwight on the question of managing these insurances. Um, if you could give me that, that clip, please, folks. So Dwight, what he had to say on the question of managing insurances. Well, let me, let me explain to you um, the, the structure of the insurance sector in the OECS. We have 160 entities or thereabouts, with 65 are active, for a population of 600,000. So have too many right away. Well, what we have are agencies and not companies because um, when you look at the math, um, insurance is the average probability of large numbers. So if you have a very large number, therefore the risks go down. So clearly, I mean, what you have is an agency arrangement. And an agency arrangement, what we do, we license and we do some modicum of regulation but the main regulation is where the, com the company as opposed to the agency resides uh, insurance I'm told um, is not the most um, easy industry to regulate I've heard this from people in developed countries and so um, it has proved very difficult um, to do this and regulators always seem to fall behind um, the, the eighth ball, as they say, when it comes to this. Um, legislation has now been upgraded, and people have been trained to deal with that. 
but we are still left so far with an agency arrangement which we have to tackle with some urgency so that we can have more responsibility mm -hmm. um, for managing an insurance sector. Peter, does that help with the point you're trying to make? Uh, it, it, it helps some, well, somewhat, but, but I think what Dwight is doing is also trying to cover or protect the regulators from a lawsuit, <laughs> as, what, as what had happened in Trinidad. As, I don't know if you're aware, but the, the, the government of Trinidad and Tobago passed some legislation, I think it was in 2011, 2012, thereabouts, where they, they, they amended the Central Bank Act to prevent any policyholder or any creditor of FICO from suing the central bank as Hold a result on. of Hold on. neglect. Because I part. asked him that question about suit. Uh, folks, could yes. you give me that clip, please? I specifically asked him about the... Okay. ...as a risk of being sued, maybe by a class of some of these same depositors. Well, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you. Um, Was it that. possible? Anything is possible. Anybody can bring a suit. Where it'll be entertained is another matter. And, and that, that's, that's exactly the point you are making, because in the interview, he was clearly making the point that they can't really be held responsible. Yeah, yeah and, and obviously he would, he would take a position where he said the regulator can't help be held responsible. But the reality is, it, it, we all have, have you know, talked about it, is either they were sleeping on a job which, which speaks to the issue of negligence, as opposed to looking the other way, which speaks to the issue of collusion. Now, it's, it's more difficult to prove that the central bank or the regulator was in collusion with the entity that they were supposed to supervise and regulate. I know in the case of Antigua, I think the, the equivalent of the supervisor of insurance or the central bank governor in Trinidad, there was a gentleman there who I think actually brought charges against because he facilitated the, um, you know, the proliferation of, of Stanford's bank uh, banking activities in in, um, in Antigua, so 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 there is precedent where regulators can, in fact, action can be taken against them, and that is exactly why the government moves very quickly to block, and and, and they had to actually change. Um, it, 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 it was a it required. A, I think it was a uh, three three fourths or three fifths majority to to, to actually do that because it was interfering with the constitutional rights of the citizens. We must take a break, though. We must take a break at this point. This is Time to Face the Facts. We'll be right back. For the latest in Caribbean culture, news, sports, and entertainment, tune in to Carib Vision. We keep you up to date on developments in your region. Carib Vision. We broadcast across the Caribbean, in the New York Tri-State area, Canada, and Europe. Carib Vision, the eyes and ears of the Caribbean. To thrive in today's dynamic business environment, you need the right partner. Digicel Business is that partner, offering you the flexibility you need to flourish. It's amazing where the right partnership can develop and how far it can take you. Contact us today. Digicel Business, complete solutions for your needs. When you send money with the Western Union, you're sending a smile. A gift, a hello, or even support. It's a fast and convenient way to stay connected with loved ones around the world or even across the Caribbean. From any of our convenient agent locations, depend on Western Union to send your money quickly and reliably. Western Union, moving money for better. Agents in Grenada, Rennick Thompson & Company, with locations in Grenville, Sotiers, Guav, Grenans, The Carinade, Bruce Street, and Carrier Coo. To thrive in today's dynamic business environment, you need the right partner. With a partner protecting your interests, you can focus on productivity. It's amazing where the right partnership can develop and how far it can take you. Contact us today. Digicel Business, complete solutions for your needs. If you are serious about business, then log on and participate in Business Advantage. Every Monday, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m., log on to www.niceradio.info. 
Business Advantage inspires you to believe that the man who wins is the one who thinks he can. Business Advantage with host Jerry George, mentoring the next generation of Caribbean entrepreneurs. 8 to 10 p.m. Mondays on www.niceradio.info. For further information, email Caribbean Information Hub at gmail.com. Like the Business Advantage Facebook page or call 1-784-456-5967 to participate. Welcome back to Time to Face the Facts as we look at the whole clique of British American debacle and ask ourselves, where are we? Tonight we spoke several times to the issue of some of these business arrangements. In the Caribbean, I think that we are becoming notorious. Let me give you a case in point uh, in a particular country. The chairman of the board is, is also the CEO. I'm hearing in Grenada that the supervisor of insurance was the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Finance. Uh, are we for real? Are we serious? It may have been a situation in Grenada, that is, of resources but, but, it but a, whether it's resources or not I'm sorry there is a fundamental conflict that that comes there no I, I agree with you I agree with you and as I was trying to, to, to make the point earlier and I go there again th there are solutions which have been thought through the the concept of okay we have a call from St. Lucia well. caller hello Hello, yes? Yes, go ahead, please. St. Lucia calling? Yes. Yes, a while ago you said we didn't get a call from St. Lucia. Thank yeah, you very um, much for calling. <laughs> I'm calling to indicate that the St. Lucia policyholders are actually belong to Barbados. Mm -hmm. Because when we got our, our, our uh, documents, they had to be sent to Barbados. Right for uh, approval and so on. So Barbados is really in charge of our, our, our situation. However, the situation was that St. Lucia, I think, is the only place in the Eastern Caribbean that indicated that something was wrong. Yes. And in fact, uh, Clico was blocked from participating in any more issuance of policies, especially the, 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 the executive premium um, situation. Yes. Now, what is interesting is that the liabilities in Barbados are very, very high compared to the assets. In the case of St. Lucia, for example, our assets are above the liabilities. So St. Lucia should be able to take care of the situation. But the argument is being given that you are in a regional mix. And that, especially, I think, from St. Vincent, they're talking about um, the issue of regionalism in the whole thing, so that St. Lucia apparently has to wait. Now, the Barbados judicial manager is not in charge of St. Lucia. St. Lucia has its own judicial manager. For the OECS, and some yes. of the other countries have individual judicial managers. Mm. So what has to happen is that the judicial managers from those various territories have to meet at some point in time to be able to rectify the situation and so uh, uh, ease up what the position is. That is the contribution. I can give you some figures, but um, uh, uh, that, will, that will take you too long. I'd love to see them, though, so I'll probably find another way to contact you to get those figures. They're, they're important, I think, for us to, in the mix of what is happening. But you see, here's a case where St. Lucia acted prudently, but they are made, they're going to, to be, seem to be part of the collateral damage. That, that is correct. St. Lucia acted uh, as far as, as, far as uh, regulatory um, office was concerned. They acted very, very, very sharply. But we have to suffer now because of the fact that the other countries did not do likewise, particularly in respect to Barbados. Uh, the situation in Barbados, well, um, 
I suppose it had to do with some political economic situations inside there. That's why uh, the situation cannot, cannot be resolved. I heard it was socio-economic, so this is political. <laughs> well, um, that's the way I can, I can describe it. I get you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You've been absolutely helpful in this, in this regard. We really appreciate that. He's not far wrong. And the truth of the matter is that the, the um, approach that allowed St. Lucia to move swiftly should have been replicated across this region. Now, if we had a piece of legislation that made sure that when once triggered in one part of the Caribbean, it had to be triggered, in CARICOM, it had to be triggered in other parts, then we would be going a long way towards solution. taking the necessary steps to solution. My concern, Jerry, is that we're not doing that. And so that we continue to more or less spent up in mud. I feel that certain things should have come out of this where you say, look, uh, th there's no need to reassess how this went wrong and what we can do as a matter of utmost urgency to try and get it right. And, and, and that approach to financial services that the gentleman is alluding to is one of them. Now, let me just, because I, I just looked at my, uh, my watch and realized we're on out of time. Here's what. We are at the point, Peter, where the statute of limitation on this whole matter is, will be passed soon. The six years is almost up. If nobody decides to bring any legal charge against this, what is going to happen? Well, statute, the statute of limitation in Trinidad and Tobago is four years on civil, sorry, on civil matters, right. criminal matters. There's no statute of limitation. Oh. So, it, you know, years after, you can, you can still be tried uh, and convicted for, but let's for, say, murder. So you, you, but the, D, the DPP has to do their job then. Sorry? The DPP. Yes, yes. <laughs> we first have to charge somebody. Exactly. And we have <laughs> Peter, Peter and Jerry is presuming that you're not going to have any criminal charges. <laughs> but that is, no, he's presuming that. <laughs> <laughs> like Jerry knows something I don't know. <laughs> Well, listen, so far, I see no evidence that anybody is moving in the direction of charging anybody criminally. I mean, it, it, it is painful. And, and that may have little to do with the evidence adduced and, and more to do with the politics of the matter. Exactly. Because one of, one of the points I, I think I, we need to make in this, in this um, dialogue here, this conversation, is that, in, like, and, and I'm sure the same thing is going to it replicate itself in Barbados. And the, and the other island of the islands. In Trinidad and Tobago, Clico had its, had its tentacles in both the, 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 the UNC um, and, and the PNM, the, those two political parties. And therefore, neither political party had the political will when they were in government to take action. It's only when the debacle came in 2009 and the PNM was in government at the time, the, as somebody said, the horse is bolted, running down the road, and they were now trying to close this table door. We have a caller. We have a caller. Caller, I think, from St. Lucia? Caller? Hello? Okay, I thought we had a caller online, but clearly not. Yeah, but, but you're right. And, and that, is, yes. that is why I'm convinced that this matter didn't just happen. It was orchestrated. Because everybody was tainted. Yes. Every government, and therefore, they knew there was a plan to what they were, they were planning to do in this. You know. But we have to, as I say, bring, start to bring to, to some closure. There's a $40 million that Trinidad had offered. You know anything about that, Peter? I, I, I heard that was mentioned. I know under the former regime, they spoke, of, they spoke about making some sort of contribution towards the, that Clico situation in the, in the rest of the Caribbean. I don't know where that is at present. Um, but $40 million uh, is nothing. Sorry, what's that? $40 million for $1.05 um, billion liability is nothing. You're correct. But, but, but let, me, let, me, let, me, let me jump in. I just want to touch on the Barbados situation a bit with Kerry. Yeah. Um, sorry? No, yes, go ahead, Peter. Yeah, Kerry, my understanding is, unlike Trinidad and Tobago, where we are now talking about uh, the CLECO being solvent and statutory fund being fully funded, 
My understanding is based on the assets uh, and the, the, proposal, the proposal that is being put forward on the table is that yeah, the Clico CIL is, is insolvent basically. Correct. And, and, and that 31 million that you're talking about that has been ring fenced, that the, the, the EFPA people are going to be paid down the road. Is it in eight years or 10 years' time, hopefully they will be able to cash in and, and get back their money? That is so right. what you in terms of in terms of facing the facts, the CIL situation is, is very dire. And what you have is a situation where the judicial manager is probably exacerbating that already bad situation because they are going to be they have to be paid out of the income, whatever Absolutely. little income is coming in from um Absolutely. from the assets of, of CIL. Is that correct? That's, yes. that's, that's, that's and the situation. longer they, the longer they keep this thing going. Both the legal people and the judicial managers are the biggest beneficiaries. I mean, something it has, has to be. Wrong, a, it has to be a source of deep concern for the policyholder in the Eastern Caribbean. Yes, exactly. Because it is all well and good to say, well, we're going to get to, we're going to do a Barbados first plan, and then we're going to come yes. to Eastern Caribbean, I suppose, second plan. But the point yes. is that there may be a number, as you know, Peter, any number of issues could arise that will delay the implementation of the Barbados plan. We have a caller. Caller? Thank you. Hello. Yes, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Yes, good evening. Go ahead, good please. Evening. Okay, great. Um, they say that if you want to catch a crook, you follow the money. <laughs> now, I can tell you that I've heard from a local manager in Grenada that they would get a call from Trinidad and notwithstanding the fact that the uh, agencies in Grenada were managed by Barbados, the cash went straight to Trinidad. Now, clearly the regulators were asleep, whether here in Trinidad or both, and I'm dismayed to hear your Trinidad guest saying that you have a, a four-year statute of limitations on civil litigation. Um, while we are sitting here doing nothing, waiting or praying or just getting our act together, the assets are being distributed. The methanol plant is being sold. Clico has, uh, even in Grenada, a number of properties that are owned through a maze of companies, which to my mind indicates uh, intent to defraud because it's not clear cut. It's owned by shell companies. They had that property that was uh, mentioned in Plantation or wherever in Florida. And one of their other companies, Angostura, is one of the world's, and this is a little known fact, largest owner of bourbon whiskey plants throughout the southern USA. Mm -hmm. So their assets all over the place, and these are being hidden, have already been hidden through shell companies. And clearly, there was intent, there was collusion, and there is a huge criminal intent that should be proven. The question is, by whom? Exactly. Have a good night. Thank you very much. That call has said it. But what, I, wanted, I want to come to something now. Barbados has done something in terms of the shareholders, and I'm sorry that caller um, has gone back, and even since St. Lucia. What has gone wrong with the people in the Eastern Caribbean, the policyholders, who are the ones, to my mind, as I look at the figures, the huge losses are, are monumental. But don't be, don't be unfair to them, though, you know. No, I'm not be, being unfair to because them. Because they have actually, the Eastern Caribbean have put submissions before the court in Barbados. Um, in response to the judicial manager's petition at one point earlier this year to wind up the company, which would have seen here and in Eastern yeah, Caribbean people getting 13 cents on the dollar, who, 12 cents or something where was the Where was the impetus behind it? Who was behind this? No, but this? I, I think that the, the, obviously there is a, what do you call it, Peter? There is a, a, a steering committee. There's a committee on insurance in the Eastern Caribbean part of the yeah. actual currency union itself. Yeah, but that's the problem. Yeah. You have the people who should be the regulators who are driving it. You have in Barbados, their shareholders committee oh, in Barbados. Oh, you're talking about the policyholders The policyholders themselves. Okay, well, fair enough. Uh, Peter represents them. Yeah. And I'm saying in the Eastern Caribbean, the OECS in particular, there's no such organization. And that, that really annoys me. But while that may be true, the danger there, um, Jerry, is that that, that kind of buys into the argument that the judicial manager has been using here, which is to say, well, you know, the Eastern Caribbean have not been sufficiently alert or they have not moved with dispatch or in your case, they don't have a, a, an organization. Um, and so therefore it justifies the fact that we have an end result, which is what we have. 
And I don't buy into the view that the ends justify the means in no, this at I all. Agree. A lot better should be done, and, and, and in my view, can be done. We, we have um, to take a break, though. This is time to face the facts. We run out of time, but we'll be right back. Just don't go away. <laughs> To thrive in today's dynamic business environment, you need the right partner. Digicel Business is that partner, offering you the flexibility you need to flourish. Our scalable solutions will increase your effectiveness and efficiency while enabling workforce mobility. Large or small, you can hide from potential threats to your business. With a partner protecting your interests, you can focus on productivity. It's amazing where the right partnership can develop and how far it can take you. Contact us today. Digicel Business, complete solutions for your needs. If you are serious about business, then log on and participate in Business Advantage. Every Monday, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m., log on to www.niceradio.info. Business Advantage inspires you to believe that the man who wins is the one who thinks he can. Business Advantage with host Jerry George, mentoring the next generation of Caribbean entrepreneurs. 8 to 10 p.m. Mondays on www.niceradio.info. For further information, email Caribbean Information Hub at gmail.com. Like the Business Advantage Facebook page or call 1 784 456 5967 to participate. Welcome back to Time to Face the Facts for Remaining Moments with uh, Mr. Kerry Simmons and Peter Pornell, Pornell from Trinidad and Tobago. Gentlemen, we have five minutes. We've got to be fast. What are some of the things that, Peter, in your situation, the government, I, I noticed that your organization seemed to have threatened the, the last administration, say, if you don't pay us, we would vote for you. Did that happen? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> we, are now being, we are now being branded the profit. profit. <laughs> now, but let me say this. Um, in our situation, we would have gotten back a significant portion of our, of our investment there, eh? unlike what is happening in, in um, Barbados and Eastern Caribbean territories. And, and one of the reasons for that uh, is that Clico Trinidad, um, they, we would have had certain assets that um, your callers would have mentioned, the Methanol uh, Holdings, Trinidad, Methanol Holdings International, Angostura, Home Construction Limited, CL World Brands, and the list goes on and on. Uh, those assets would have depreciated in value in 2009. Some of it, some of them, some of, part of it was stolen and so on, but we wouldn't go into that right now. Uh, and those assets have been managed over the, over the period and they have now uh, appreciated in value. Some have been monetized and hence the reason uh, the government was able to, to, to pay policyholders a significant portion of the investment and they would have gotten back some of the money that they, invest, they, they put out in terms of the bailout. So that where we are now is we are asking for the balance that is owed to us. So we are not in, in, a, in you know, as bad a situation as what I'm hearing that is going on in Barbados and, and Eastern Caribbean but territory. The average person listening thinks that this is, this is discrimin discriminatory, that Trinidad is getting sorted out, and a lot of the monies went there. What happened to us? No, well, that is, the, that is what I was, trying to, 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 I was trying to explain. Those assets that Trinidad and Tobago uh, have, those are assets that would have been purchased with funds of Trinidad and Tobago policyholders. Mm -hmm. And those policyholders from the other territories would have bought policy in Trinidad and Tobago. You follow? Yes, I'm going so to. So that, so, so, that, so that those assets, the first call on those assets would be to pay the policyholders, Trinidad and Tobago policyholders, and those policyholders from the other territories that purchased their policies in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, that's just that is just the reality, and that's just how the, the legal framework is set up. Now, I, I am I am agreeing that that commitment that was made by the government to make some funds available. I think you told the figure. I'm not too sure what the, the actual figure was, but I think you said 14 million. Is it 14 million US? Or it, it was 40 million US. Yes, but there were some conditionalities. Right. I also understand to that. I don't know, care might no more, and that was part right. of the, yeah. That's part of the reason why that it has not been. Um, this oh, both the conditionalities. Yeah. But I would support that that payment once 
the conditionalities, and, and assuming those conditionalities are reasonable, have been met, that that payment should be made. You know, I, I would support that because that's the least Trinidad and Tobago could do to assist our, um, you know, our, our counterparts in the other um, Caribbean territories. But to come back to, Trinidad, to, 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 to the question, you don't want, you're happy to wind up in about five minutes, so, uh, uh, or less than five minutes. Less so than five saying, minutes. Uh, I, my, our, our hearts go out to the, 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 the people, uh, the policyholders in Barbados. I know June Fowler very well. I, I came over there uh, early in the game and I, I had an opportunity to chat with those policyholders, to chat with the, the people who are the, uh, in charge of that group. And they're really doing yeoman service to try to get those money back. But I think the, the, the facts have to be fake. PIL is a totally different situation to what is going on with Clico Trinidad. The assets are just not there to pay those policyholders uh, immediately. I think the plan is supposed to, over time, generate some cash flows, and hopefully everybody will get paid. They, they, it's not the perfect plan. There are a lot of flaws in it, uh, clearly. Uh, uh, but what I would suggest is that people really try to get something going very quickly. But the longer they take, the judicial managers and the legal people, they are the ones who are going to get rich off <laughs> of this particular issue. Get rich again? Let me come with Kerry, because Kerry, you have like two minutes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, no, no, I, P Peter's assessment is absolutely right. Um, in Barbados, there is a completely different situation. It is not a happy one. Um, the, the plan that is currently on the table, so-called Barbados First, is really going to, first of all, you're going to have to see a lot of those EFPAs um, mature over a 10-year, they'll be treated as 10-year annuities. Right. Um, I think the real concern is going to be a crisis of confidence because even creating a new company, and Peter, you, you've made the point about confidence before, create yes. a new company and so on. The reality is that what business is it really going to do in an environment in which, as we've heard every caller tonight, they all come back to the same bottom line. The undercurrent in all of this is, Man, people money get take up and, and, and do whatever they want to do with it and nobody has been brought to justice. There's no follow through. And there's going to be, I think, a great reluctance to buy into this business. The this new business the, that they talked about. The, yes, precisely. The new company is just the same thing in a different form. Um, so I, no, I, but, but why? My question about that whole question of new co as they call it is this. Why would somebody want to buy into a company the predecessor of which was managed by the people, the same people who failed them. <laughs> well, I mean, you, 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 even, even if the, the management was different, um, I think that what has happened here and in the region is that because there has been no bringing to conclusion uh, by way of, of, of either prosecution or satisfactory follow through on some of the wrongdoing that took place, you're going to find it very hard for people to believe that they should pick up their money and reinvest in this kind of thing. Your last word. Peter, 10 seconds yes. for your last closing statement. Well, I would just like to thank you for, for inviting me on your program, Jerry. I think you had a very interesting two hours. That I didn't know how two hours to fly this quickly. Yes, it can. But there's so much, <laughs> but there's so much to talk about the click use. There are so many facets. I think we just scratched the surface. Absolutely. And hopefully, hopefully you will be, you'll invite me on again and, and Kerry. And we can have a more, um, you know, um, very fruitful. Absolutely. And, and, you know. Thank you very much for spending your time with us, even though uh, using the technology that has worked brilliantly well tonight. Kerry, thanks again for Thank coming. You. Thank you. Folks, this has been Time to Face the Facts. We trust tonight it has given you a better sense of the Clico British American situation. I'm Jerry George. Thank you, and remember to join us the next time we're here. So long.